us, actually. They're so inquisitive. <laughs> In the spring of 1982, this coastal paradise turned ugly as the Falkland Islands became a brutal war zone where British and Argentine forces battled for control of the land. But today, the Falklands are again a peaceful haven for animals and people alike. Yeah, we're in the Falkland Islands. This was put on the map in 1982 when the British troops fought for the Queen. But today, we're going out to see a different kind of royalty. We're going out to see king penguins, First time in the season I've been able to go out and check these. They should have some really, really large chicks. Great looking guys, like large, giant large teddy bears. You may be wondering why a penguin researcher is tooling around the Falklands in a sports car. Well, before he got into behavioral science, Mike designed engines for Jaguar and did a little pro racing on the side. But he gave up life in the fast lane when he got married. And he's now devoted to his two other loves his wife, and penguins. Well, this is Volunteer Point. This is the main part of the king penguin colony. Mike wasn't kidding. The chicks look just like teddy bears with their thick brown plumage. And they're pretty unruly, too, scurrying around without a care in the world. <laughs> the parents are pretty amusing in their own right, but if you look carefully, you'll see they're a lot more serious. They know the chicks are in for a really big transformation. We've got some here that are actually changing their plumage from the chick plumage, which is really brown and bushy, slowly shedding out into the adult plumage. The one right in front of us, which has a very pale yellow, and you can see the plumage is rather patchy. He's just in the process of what they call fledging. These chicks were born last January. They've been here right through the worst of the winter. And now they're just about reached full size. And in about three to four weeks, they'll be going to sea for the very first time in their lives to start catching their own food. Once they're off on their own, life won't be easy. The naive babies will have only a few precious days to become expert fishermen. And the ones that don't get the hang of it will eventually die of starvation. It's a harsh dose of reality for these chicks who, up till now, been totally dependent on their parents. The chicks continually beg for food all the time, and uh, sometimes the parents get quite fed up with it because when they haven't got any more food to give them, uh, the chicks will continually pester them for hours. And if the, if the adult gets really fed up with it, he'll start hitting the young one with his flippers to tell it to stop pestering. There's a lot of uh, comparisons between human behavior and uh, these penguins. This one's being followed by his young chick. The chick is well fed, but he's still demanding more food, and the adult hasn't got anything else to give him. That can lead to fights. And Mike often records how these squabbling families talk to each other. Each individual bird has a call that is unique to that bird. Adults and chicks recognize each other by those unique calls. The chicks have a sort of real peeping, high-pitched high piping sort of sound. And the adults have this really majestic uh, trumpeting sound. They put their neck right up in the air and sort of really trumpet. We also notice the penguins' feet, and the strange way the birds have of resting. And that's a very suitable stance for these penguins because they don't have nests. They place the chicks and the eggs on their feet and hold them off the ground to keep them warm. That enables them to live in very cold climes or even on ice chutes. They're very curious, actually. They're, they're so inquisitive. They want to have a look at everything. They come up and investigate when you put things down on the ground. They'll climb over boxes, bags. They sense everything through their beaks. And right now, they seem to sense we're watching them, which makes them very excited. <laughs> I'm going to have to see if these guys let me have my camera back. Sorry, guys. I need the camera. Thank you. Now that he's regained control of his camera, Mike concentrates on filming their behavior, which at this time of year can be very interesting. 
got a pair copulating down there. It's a short affair. It only lasts a few seconds. But uh, the, these birds have got no eggs yet. This is actually the mating time now. They're just going into the phase of going through the copulation, and then they'll be laying eggs in about two months' time. I do studies every year to determine whether the population size is increasing or decreasing. But I think probably the most enjoyable part is the interactions, because in addition to the scientific stuff, they're just great animals to be working with. They're so friendly and curious. The experience is just wonderful. You couldn't get a better, better, better species of animal or bird to work with. There's only one town in the Falkland Islands, and we're nowhere near it. Instead, we're taking a tiny plane to one of the most secluded spots on the Falkland chain. We touch down on something approximating a runway and taxi up to the island settlement. Only 10 people live here, and they're all part of a British research team that's studying the reproductive and migratory habits of local birds, especially the albatross. The researcher we're hooking up with is Mike Bingham. This is Saunders Island, and this is the big general store. I'm here to be putting some identification tags on albatross so we know what they're doing, where they're going in the winter months. We've got about an hour's drive to get out there, so we better get going. It may look desolate, but this island's full of wildlife. You just need to know where to go to find it. Mike's been here so long, he knows all the right spots. This is the main area where a lot of the penguins are breeding, and they're actually mixed in with the albatross, which is where we're actually heading up now to start the counting. This is as far as the vehicle goes, so it's all on foot from here. As soon as we start, we're met by a little surprise. Look what we've got here. We've got this seal up here. And he has the itch. It's quite likely that he's come up here to have a look and see if there's any penguins. They sometimes come up and actually enter into penguin colonies to actually try and catch penguins, taking them out of their burrows. See you later. We follow Mike up an unmarked and harrowing trail to the high cliffs where the seabirds perch. It's here that we'll tag or ring the albatross. Okay, well here's a group we can work with. A lot of the albatross are on very, very steep, cliffy areas, which obviously are difficult to get around, but this area here, they're nicely laid out on an area. It's not too difficult to get around them, so uh, let's, let's get ringing. What we've got to remember here is that these are big birds. They've got a large bill with a hook on the end, and if they bite us, they're going to do us some damage. So we've got to be really careful because it's so easy to slip. To do the ringing, it's going to need two people. It's going to need one person to actually take hold of the bird. The second person actually puts the ring on its leg. It's not going to be the easiest job, so which one of you guys is going to give me a hand? But before we can help with the tagging, Mike's got to show us the proper way to grab hold of these boisterous birds. As you can see, I've got hold of his head and his body, and his legs are now free to do the ringing. But we get the feeling this won't be as easy as it sounds. Why don't I put the ring on to him? Because that's not the, the ring is a difficult bit. Well, then let's give it the old college try. Except we never took a course in anything like this. This is not exactly what I had in mind when I came out to the wreck. That's it. Try and get around the side of him. He's following your body, unfortunately. That's it. That's fine. That's good. That's good. Ah! Use your other hand. Move your hand in and out. That's it. He's winning. He's angry. He's angry, which is fine. Ah, uh, me again. I can't get this one. He's better. He's faster. Ah. Than I'm going as fast as I can. I'll try one, one more with my right hand. Ah. Ah. Oh, I tell you. I mean, the bill is big, you know? I mean, but that's just, just a bird, but at the same time. So we move on to another bird. And it that, seems we might be getting the hang of it. Straight away. That's got it. Mm. You're losing mm. him. Let him go. Remember, Let him go. I did go. say yeah. might be getting the hang of it. You haven't got his wing. It's hard. It's harder than it looks. I mean, he does it so easily, but... That's good, Rick. That's good. 
That's excellent. Oh, that was good. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm losing him. I'm losing okay, put him down, put him down. Then at last, success. That's good. If you can hold him like that, we've got him. Heart's just pounding. But Mike's not so sure, so he rushes to get the tag on. All right, I've got to get the ring over his leg, tighten it up just a little this way, and then that way, tighten it just a little. And that's it. He's done. Now you can see how the ring is a really loose fit. It just goes up and down, no problem at all. Now put him down at the side of the nest, let him go up on his own. We don't want him breaking the egg in the panic. That's but uh, he goes straight back onto the nest and, and everything's all right. He doesn't even know the ring's there, huh? The ring is a very loose fit. It's free to move up and down the leg. It doesn't hinder the birds at all. We've had birds that have been ringed in 1960, 61, that are still breeding now after more, well over 35 years. He won't ever need to be handled again. That's it. That's it, because, because next year, I can see from here he's got a ring on, and that's all I need. Next year is when I come back, I just see if that nest has got a bird with a ring on it, and if I have, yeah, he's okay, he's from last year. And by doing this, I can determine what the adult mortality is. How many adults die once they're away from the colony each year? And that's what we need to know, because unless we can actually determine how many of the adults are dying year by year as well, then you can't relate whether they're producing enough chicks to replace them with the adults that are dying. <laughs> What's the wingspan of the world's largest albatross? 11 feet, 8 feet, or 6 feet? The answer when we return.